Well, welcome to today's CEDA live stream. Headlines, hype and reality, Australia's blockchain opportunity. I'm Melinda Salento, the Chief Executive of CEDA, the Committee for Economic Development of Australia, and I'm glad that you can join us today. Can I start by uh, acknowledging the land on which I'm joining uh, this live stream from, the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the role that they play um, in sharing knowledge, heritage, history and culture with all of us in the spirit of reconciliation. Well, I'm very pleased to be moderating today's session on, on blockchain and blockchain opportunity in Australia. For those of you who follow CEDA's agenda, you'll know that we have an area of work that we call public interest technology. And the focus of that agenda is very much on how we make sure that emerging technologies are developed, adopted and used in the public interest and for public benefit. Sitting right at the heart of that agenda and those issues uh, is uh, the governance of new technologies, how we make sure that technology is governed in the interests of the wider, wider community, but also how we can use emerging technologies uh, to create benefits for as many as possible and to improve the delivery of government services, human services, and in fact, improve the quality of government overall. So there's a lot in that, and blockchain certainly, I think, has an awful lot to offer. Um, we talked in our promo line, if you like, around the hype. There certainly is a lot of hype. It is a still an emerging technology, not that old, uh, a little over 10 years. And as I was doing some preparation for this live stream, I, of course, was listening to some views and ideas from others um, that took me to a conversation from a number of researchers from the Imperial College uh, in London who talked about um, comparing blockchain to the internet, where the internet is all about disseminating information and how blockchain actually enables us to facilitate the exchange of value and very much in a different way to what we're used to. Uh, it is really all about disintermediation uh, and really our whole economic structures to date have relied heavily on intermediaries. So their conclusion was that really blockchain presents the opportunity for an entirely new economic structure. Um, that is a really big topic and has really significant implications, including for policy and regulation here in Australia. So I think it's really incumbent upon all of us to understand what those impacts are, uh, both good and bad, uh, and how we can make the best use of, of blockchain. Uh, to help us unpack all of those issues and probably a heck of a lot more, we have with us today Greg Medca Medcraft, who is a non-executive director of, Australian, of the Australian Finance Group, Dr. Li Ming Zhu, who is a research director, software and computational systems at Data61 with the CSIRO, and Doug Campbell, who is the general manager of Australia, Convergence.tech. Uh, each of them is going to speak for about seven minutes then we're going to go to Q&A, and I think there's going to be a lot of questions. So uh, it's up to you to get in early. Um, jump onto the Pigeonhole app, which you can do through your um, live stream page, or just enter cedar.pigeonhole.at in your browser. The password, not surprisingly, is blockchain. Um, and if you want to join us uh, and share your thoughts on Twitter, please tag me at Melinda Salento and at cedar underscore news. Uh, hashtag blockchain. That's probably enough from me. Um, as I said, seven minutes from each of the speakers, and we're going to start with you, Greg. Over to you. Great. Thanks, uh, Melinda, and thank you for having me. Uh, well, clearly, the COVID pandemic has accelerated uh, economy-wide digitalization with a lot of activity activity economically uh, moving online faster than probably it would have. For example, surveys uh, research by OECD actually shows that 70% of SMEs actually globally have intensified the use of digital technologies. So in digital solutions have often scaled to meet this demand and the heart of much of these solutions is often about data that can be trusted. And as we know, you know, incumbents have uh, rushed to digitalize challenges at times. Startups um, have uh, looked to uh, take profitable business lines uh, to challenge business models and even invented entirely new markets. So 
the blockchain market is a subset of this growth in digitalization, and it was uh, $3 billion in 2020, according to Fortune uh, Business Insights, and it's projected to grow to $104 billion by 2028, with strong growth coming from applications in payments, uh, smart contracts, supply chain, due diligence and finance, and digital identity, and sectorally, financial services, uh, manufacturing and healthcare. And obviously, Australia has an opportunity to participate in this global growth in the blockchain market by leveraging and building on its comparative advantages to export our expertise and also to create jobs. And here are just seven examples uh, that I think are quite important. First is in the crypto custody and exchanges area. Now, as a highly regarded jurisdiction by investors for its safety and soundness, this growth area is a good opportunity. Australian startups like Independent Reserve have just been authorised in this area by the MAS. Uh, I would say, why not Australia? Secondly, asset tokenization. We've already seen with startups in Australia like Rush Gold or Infinity Gold, the, you know, they started already. And one of the benefits of tokenization is it enables greater access to investment opportunities uh, by, for example, enabling fractional ownership of assets, but also direct capital raising by issuers to investors. Thirdly, is central bank digital currencies and stable coins. Often the missing link uh, in digitalization is the payment leg. For example, the issuance and trading of equity and debt, the process we know can be cumbersome with opportunities for better speed, transparency, and lower cost and lower counterparty risk. And the ASX is going the first step with clearing and settlement using DLT on the securities leg. Uh, and also we had an example of the World Bank digital bond issue uh, uh, about 18 months ago, led by the CBA. They again went similarly, but didn't do the payment leg. Fourthly is supply chain due diligence, management and finance, leveraging trust in responsible supply chains with fast, transparent, immutable traceability from source to destination, whether it be in providence, licit payments or payments of custom duties. For example, Everledger in the diamond supply chain uh, or Tesla for sustaining uh, sourcing of cobalt from the uh, DRC. Fifthly is decentralized finance, distributed finance in lending uh, and asset management, combining blockchain and II, which we're going to see more and more, to reduce friction costs and improve efficiency and access. For example, mortgage origination and servicing and trading occurs in the USA uh, with a startup uh, company called Figure, which uses the Providence block blockchain. Uh, the sixth thing is ESG tech, uh, leveraging, uh, leveraging Australia's ex uh, expertise, for example, in infrastructure combined again with uh, the Internet of Things, AI machine learning and blockchain to monitor risk and to provide better information to investors and in turn improve capital access. And then finally, digital identity to secure data for health records. For example, in Spain, airports have set up blockchain-based COVID testing and certification issuance. But how do you do it? Well, creating the right enabling environment for blockchain innovation is critical. And the OECD uh, research papers and hundreds of hours of consultation with industry, government, academics, and civil society has identified five expectations of industry and others in terms of responsible blockchain development. Firstly, is compliance, meeting relevant uh, policy, legal and regulatory requirements, including for more decentralised and public networks. Secondly, is governance, accountability and transparency, being open and inclusive about the design of network protocols and incentives. Thirdly, is interoperability, between the blockchain and non-blockchain networks to support the flow of data, encourage competition, and empower individuals' control of data. Fourthly, is digital security, understanding the risks, taking responsibility for business continuity and treatment of personal data. And fifth, and most importantly, is education and skills development, promoting 
understanding of blockchain and its potential applications, benefits and risks amongst all stakeholders, including as to where and how decision-making takes place, especially in more decentralised blockchains. The OECD has just recently finalised a public consultation on these uh, five key principles uh, to have a glo common global reference point for policy making on blockchain. In addition, there's five areas of guidance for governments. First is developing coordinated policy strategies in concerning blockchain, which are innovation friendly and take into account the technology's cross-border nature. Secondly, is supporting blockchain research, development and investment. And a good example we have on this call, Doug, uh, but also uh, the Australian government's recent announcement of funding for a digital finance CRC. Thirdly, is striving to build skills and capacity around blockchain, including through education and training. Fourthly, most importantly, is creating an enabling policy environment which actually means consulting widely on regulation and policy and developing institutional capabilities and mechanisms to best understand the technology's impact on policy priorities. For example, regulatory sandboxes and innovation labs, and perhaps thinking about a digital law reform commission, ensuring that laws and the legal system keep pace with the digital age, looking ahead on the horizon five to 10 years and shaping and implementing laws and regulations that, again, promote flexibility, innovation and agility while balancing with appropriate protection. And then finally, fifthly, most importantly, cooperating internationally on blockchain, including driving consistency in the national approaches and promoting fair and open processes for global technical and market standards. I think with the right enabling environment, blockchain combined with AI and machine learning could no doubt form the basis of Australia's position in the future as a technology and finance hub. Thank you. And I'll pass over to you, Li Ming. All right. Uh, thanks, Greg. I think uh, that was very insightful. I, I'm going to probably echoing a lot of the things you just mentioned. Uh, so coming from CSRO's data Chuan, which is the National Science Agency, most of my comments would be coming from the technology and the innovation point of view. Uh, back in 2019, uh, Data C1 and Australian Computer Society released a report called Blockchain 2030, a look at the future of blockchain in Australia, which painted a you know, possibility of a very bright future. It can be a bit nervous two years down the track to revisit some, some of one's own predictions, but I feel we are definitely on the track to that bright future. Back then, uh, we already identified uh, blockchain is more of a general purpose technology that is enabling multiple industries because we are already seeing a sign of vibrant blockchain driven innovation across all Australian industry sectors. It was largely led by financial industries by a large margin, uh, with some sectors like mining, education, you know, food processing a bit lagging. But it has been very pleasing to see these activities in all the sectors have been picked up a bit further. I think one of the key drivers in the last two years was really Australia's national blockchain roadmap led by DISER, the Department of Industry Science and Energy and the Resources, in close consultation with industry and research organizations like the H1. You know, very few countries in the world actually have a national roadmap for blockchain. So DISER's blockchain roadmap, together with the four industry-led working groups, clearly identify some of the opportunity areas in Australia, such as critical supply chain, credentialing in education space, cybersecurity, and regulation technologies. And following on from that, that Greg um, mentioned, and Doug will give a bit more details, Dizer have uh, recently put sub substantial funding into two industry-led pilots. So one is on blockchain for compliance and ethical certification of critical mineral processing, led by Everledger, and this one is also part of that, of that uh, in collaboration with other innovators like Civic Ledger. This is really to leverage Australian strengths uh, in mining and its strategic ambition in critical metal processing, starting from how to improve supply chain trust by ethical processing certificates, and among many other ESG issues like environment, society, and governance issues. And Doug will give a lot of details into the food processing one. From a standards point of view, um, as I'm chairing the Australian Standards Committee on Blockchain, 
for many of you, you probably don't know, actually, Australia was the country that proposed the need for international standards through ISO, and we got wider support a, a few years back. Australia is still holding the international chairperson position, so that's great down, uh, why I chair Australia's committee. So Australians industry and academics have really been very active across multiple working groups in ISO standards. They are very well respected internationally while prioritizing opportunities and use cases most relevant to Australia. Uh, recently, I think trade finance, trade data flow, supply chain has always been um, you know, another example in the standard space. As uh, Greg mentioned earlier, uh, Australian government recently have funded uh, the Digital Finance uh, Cooperative Research Center to the tune of $100 million, uh, which is a combination of federal funding and industry, uh, industry funding. And really the focus of this particular CRC, the Cooperative Research Center, is about digitizing real world assets. And as Greg mentioned, as one of the key things. Uh, and again, the priority here is to focus on assets in which Australian is particularly strong. For example, minerals, real estate, infrastructure, energy, and agriculture, but also some upcoming assets like carbon credits and compound assets like carbon neutral minerals. So this CRC is really quite unique as more than half of the work and the innovation will be done on finance and law and regulation. So digital is only part of it. It's really a true cross-discipline collaboration where data strength is heavily involved as well. In this CRC, we realize blockchain is really giving us a framework for creation and exchanging of digital assets, but it will require a massive effort from all of you to connect that framework to the reality, meaning how to redevelop and adjust the existing legal and market infrastructure in order to truly unblock the economic benefits from that framework. So it's not really about blockchain per se, but it's our economic infrastructure itself changing based on what blockchain can offer. It will also help Australian SMEs like by equity and inclusive access to finance uh, through the tokenization. As you can see, blockchain is a key component, a two set of a larger ecosystem. Another key point I want to make, and echoing what Greg said earlier, as an emerging technology, blockchain is really interacting with many other emerging technologies like AI, cybersecurity, and quantum. You know, these days when we talk about AI, AI is really not just about very smart machine learning algorithm. It's really all about the data that the AI and the machine learning algorithm need to operate on. Data is valuable. And those value often arises from combining and sharing data. Sometimes this very high valuable data can be very sensitive. And due to the privacy concerns, or maybe it's inherent commercial value, or the sovereign nature of some of the data. So blockchain has been playing and can play an increasing role in data sharing not only ensure data integrity, but also introduce a lot of the incentives for sharing and making sure the benefits and the value derived from machine learning and AI are attributed back to the data contributors and owners, whether you are individual or you, know, you are uh, SME uh, in the long supply chain, the incentives and the value redistribution back is really the key. Another thing around blockchain and cybersecurity, uh, you may have heard recently, for example, together with Monash University, Saros Data Citizen have developed uh, the world's most efficient, uh, the world first most e efficient blockchain protocol that's both secure against future quantum computers and also protects the privacy of its users. It has been licensed to HCash. So it's, it's demonstrated some of the innovation Australia is leading in this space. And recognizing all these interactions, and the talent needs in this, you may have heard that Australia have introduced the new National AI Center, which is coordinated by the Yixuan, which have two graduate programs. One is on AI, and the other is on emerging technologies like blockchain, cyber, and quantum. They will support 500 future talents going through the scholarship program to be trained in these areas. I think the bigger picture is really the trust architectures in the society and the business is changing, introducing some new needs in economic infrastructure and incentives. And in this new economic landscape, I believe blockchain will play a critical role in this trust architecture shift. You know, for enabling incentives and data sharing and the democratization of AI, 
for a lot of the inclusiveness, diversity of ecosystem participants, not just big companies, but SMEs and individuals. Give Australian SMEs some future competitiveness in innovation, trust in their products and, and integration into the global supply chain. And finally, transforming some of the key industries, not just in financial industry, but in manufacturing industry, such as the examples given you know, uh, by Greg and, and myself in mining, critical uh, metal processing, food processing, critical infrastructure, government services, and public infrastructure. So I, I think the opportunities are endless. So I continue to be very optimistic about the blockchain opportunities in Australia. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to pass on to Doug. Excellent. Thanks, Li Ming. Uh, appreciate that. So, yeah, my role here today is uh, to discuss and share some of the practical applications of blockchain for Australian businesses, being an Australian business uh, leveraging blockchain in market. So, uh, one of the primary benefits of blockchain, as, as Li Ming and Greg both touched on, is as an enabler of trust. You know, there are countless business processes, um, if you think through your own business, that rely on trust between entities themselves and between entities and individuals. So, verifying the claims that people make or entities make is typically where business will incur costs and suboptimal use of resources, and naturally where intermediaries, intermediaries have historically and currently make some money. So, we have, we have a number of projects leveraging the blockchain that expedites uh, trust and verification. So, let's start with the big one. It's, as previously mentioned, um, Li Meng outlined the, uh, the DICE roadmap, the National Blockchain Roadmap. Um, so, that vehicle, coupled with the Prime Minister and Cabinet's deregulation task force and some successful industry lobbying, uh, gave rise to uh, the, the blockchain pilot grant uh, for, for which Convergence Tech have, have started uh, the discovery phase uh, just recently. So, um, the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources uh, com commissioned that grant and uh, we're now working on, as with any technology project, some kind of an interesting acronym for this project. So, I think we called it BASE this morning, the Blockchain Automated Spirits Excise Project. I thought coming into this, I'd like to play with acronyms. Maybe let's call it BEAST, the Blockchain Excise Automated Spirits Tax Project. So, maybe BEAST will be the one we settle on. It's an eight-month project. Uh, it's working with the producers of spirits. So, whiskey, uh, vodka, and, and the like. Hopefully, I'll get to sample some of those uh, along the journey, uh, just in discovery at the moment. So, I uh, haven't really uh, got into that yet. Uh, but also with the Australian Tax Office uh, as the regulators uh, for the excise process. Now, uh, the excise regulations have been fairly complex, and, and industry is required to calculate and pay excise at, at, at you know, particular specific points of, of that process, which can be you know, challenging and difficult for some of the small to medium players, but also the large players uh, to, to ensure they're compliant with that excise um, calculation and remittance points at, at different parts of the, of the manufacturing and production processes. So, the intent of the project is to leverage blockchain blockchain to improve this process for both industry and, and the regulators. In essence, improving the trust uh, and verifying the product status and therefore the excise compliance requirements. So, the project is going to aim to track raw materials and products from importation through the uh, production and manufacturing process through to distribution. Uh, it'll be leveraging smart contracts and uh, a digital currency. Uh, Greg mentioned uh, the stable coin uh, concept, uh, and that's certainly something we have the ambition to be trialing as part of this grant. And those capabilities will help automate the calculation and remittance of excise as it falls due through those uh, fairly complex processes. So, as part of the pilot, we intend to quantify the benefits of blockchain, um, providing industry with frictionless processing and automated compliance. And that should free up resources, um, yeah, typically in their finance teams who would have spent weeks on calculations and remittance processes. And then for the regulators, this should also increase transparency of manufacturer and, and movement of goods, um, freeing up their uh, officers' time to focus on higher value tasks. So, let's uh, turn our attention to another use case, and, and that this one is uh, probably more commonly understood and known, and, and it's been touched on uh, by Greg and Li Ming, that of traceability and provenance. Um, so, the intent there is really to um, support producers to capture a high proportion of the sale of goods through the ability to trace the this, this source of production back to themselves. Um, through using uh, blockchain capabilities, uh, this uh, will empower the consumer and buyers and investors to make more informed decisions, whether that be procurement or purchase or investment. 
Uh, we've worked with the, the the UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, in a pretty uh, interesting and varied uh, areas of the world uh, to help producers of cashmere in Mongolia. Um, so our team got close, probably too close to some goats, but anyway, we'll talk about that another time. Um, we've been helping women's cooperatives uh, in their production of argan oil uh, and traceability in Morocco. Uh, that's used in cosmetics and moisturizer. Perhaps I need some of that right now. Um, uh, and this provenance and traceability capability will help organizations provide evidence of their environmental, social and governance actions. So I think it can be applicable to, to any business who is, is truly wanting to, to prove evidence around ESG. So lastly, let me turn to uh, another application of trust, which uh, is probably relevant to so many of us right now. I'm, I'm from Melbourne, I'm in lockdown. I'm sure many of you are from Sydney and Canberra in similar, similar circumstances. So what might help uh, right now is the concept and, and implementation of dig verifiable digital credentials. And I know both state and federal governments are progressing with this. Now, why is that important? Um, well, again, un underpinning the verifiable digital credentials is, is the blockchain capability. But what, is, what does it mean? So basically, it enables me, when I need to make a claim about me or my status and prove that claim to a third party who, who doesn't know me. So there are obvious examples here. So for example, education and skills. So if I need to prove that I hold a certain qualification or if I've completed uh, a particular uh, training course or kept my CPD status. Um, but also, um, you know, there, right now there's a, there's a huge requirement and, and um, momentum in, in the, the economy and citizens around proving our health status. Um, so, you know, naturally our vaccine status and or our COVID-19 uh, negative test status uh, as the international borders open up and we want to travel overseas. So supporting uh, that proof of claim uh, for an individual, um, uh, either through health or skills, are the digital credentials. And for digital credentials to work in, in an environment, in a macro environment, you need three actors. First actor is the issuer, so um, the, the organization that grants the credential. So, for example, uh, in Singapore, we've uh, worked with 450 pathology labs. Um, for, so when you, when you want to leave Singapore, you need to prove that you've had a negative COVID test within 72 hours prior to departure. So um, the 450 pathology labs are uh, issuing a digital credential to the people who've come in and had the test, and obviously those who pass negative get a digital credential put into their digital wallets. Uh, that, those people who've had the test are known as the holder. That's the second actor. So the holder of the credential, those who've earned the credential. And lastly, the third actor is naturally the, the, the entity or individual who needs to verify that the holder has that uh, claim and, and can prove that claim. So the verifying organization in this example is obviously emigration at, at the airport. So um, the government authorities can, can verify the digital uh, credential. Now, this capability is really um, uh, digitizing, as Greg talked about, you know, the speed of digitization. Obviously, COVID has, has meant consumers, citizens, and businesses have, have um, really uh, adopted uh, things such as QR codes as almost second nature now. So when we go get a coffee or, or, or visit a workplace, you know, the QR codes are accepted by us as individuals and, and businesses in terms of verific verification. So um, we see um, blockchain as enabler to this uh, self-sovereign identity and proof of claim. And again, ultimately proving trust. So we think there are significant benefits for the, the Australian uh, economy uh, by adopting these verifiable digital credentials on, on blockchain. It, it will provide a more, a more mobile and portable workforce, uh, able to more swiftly claim their, their skills, qualifications, and health status. Obviously, you know, we've had experience of providing uh, vaccine status uh, for, for access to aged care homes, for example, obviously a very important uh, credential proof point uh, before accessing a vulnerable population with a, with a potential trans transmissible disease. Uh, we see it as also providing significant reduction in onboarding costs for business. So um, uh, uh, there's a lot of intermediaries out there at the moment who need to prove that uh, potential employees do hold, um, for example, defence clearance or, or safety qualifications or, or educational qualifications. So uh, through the uh, ability to, pr to prove that uh, through tamper-proof digital credentials, um, that, that will um, uh, significantly reduce onboarding time and cost for business. 
And also the fact that um, these credentials are tamper-proof will also improve safety ultimately um, you know, for, for work sites that have danger and or you know, the aged care example where we need to prove a health status before uh, accessing a, a, a vulnerable, po vulnerable population. And lastly, before I hand back to you, Melinda, there's, a, there's an exciting project being from the Europe myself and my favourite game being the round ball game. Uh, we're actually working with a European soccer club at the moment. We're going live, I think, in 10 days' time uh, with the production of um, non-fungible tokens or, or NFTs, as they're known, and in the blockchain nomenclature um, for trading cards. So we're producing a whole set of um, trading cards on the blockchain that can be you know, issued to fans and, and create a sort of unique marketplace um, so people can you know, buy and sell um, people, you know, their favorite players scoring a particular goal or earning promotion or, or so on and so forth. So there are some more uh, fun uh, use cases for um, perhaps the sporting clubs or unique entertainment um, uh, outcomes or actions out there. So um, uh, back to you, Melinda. Well, thanks. Thanks for closing that out, Doug. Um, can I just say the three of you did a fantastic job handing off and also in in providing so much um, content to sort of get the conversation going. Um, Doug, I'm just, can I just follow up on, you know, you, you talked about a lot of um, really great real world examples that talked about really how you apply blockchain to physical um, goods, basically. Um, and I guess if I'm going to be honest, I can get my head around sort of digital tokens and things like that and, and, and the provenance of that and, the, you know, how that all gets protected within blockchain. But how do, you, how do you go about attaching a physical good to blockchain in a, in a trusted way? What's the process there? So that, well, there are a, a number of mechanisms, um, but yeah, uh, in in some of the examples for for the UNDP projects, there we we would use uh, RFID um, uh, stickers, um, which are very uh, economical to produce, and they can be actually physically attached to uh, the the produce at the point of manufacture that can travel with um, uh, the product as it moves through the supply chain, um, or as um, using using smart contracts uh, as a you know a, a bottle of alcohol, for example, moves from one location location to another, the fact um, that it's that it's moved will trigger a, um, a business rule that's contained in a smart contract to, to actually you know, determine that certain excise may be payable at a point in time. So there's, um, there's a concept of smart labeling, um, but also um, as business rules are uh, triggered through the smart contracts, um, yeah, uh, logic can be uh, applied, if you like, or executed. So that's the, that's the benefit of being the moderator. I get to ask my little questions to improve my knowledge. Um, I'm going to throw a question to all three of you, um, and it's each of you talked about um, trust and um, uh, inclusivity in one way or another, um, and the benefits of um, blockchain technology for that. And if I go back to my opening comments, where you know I was sort of talking about some of the researchers saying this is a whole new economic structure, does away with the intermediaries. The intermediaries are the ones who sort of built trust in the system previously for us. Um, in a, in a technology that I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think a lot of people really deeply understand blockchain and what it does and how it works. So how do we actually make that technology inclusive and how do we build trust in that if, if there are so many in the population that, that probably don't really fully understand it at, at, at this stage? I mean, I, I guess I, I'm just interested in how you sort of join the dots on that and happy for one of you to jump in. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to start. Uh, I think you know, responsible innovation or responsible technology is a really a key issue these days, especially for emerging technologies. So that you can learn quite a lot from looking at how other emerging technologies are being governed. Uh, for example, in AI, Australia has an AI ethics framework that was released by Dyser in, in conjunction with industry and, and led by Lady Sichuan. So there are high level principles, uh, all developers, and organization need to adhere to. So Australia's AI ethics principle has, has eight. And at the moment, there's a, a also work in quantum computing ethics principles. And I agree with Greg, we need more in blockchain, uh, you know, responsible blockchain principles as well. But they, don't, they probably will end up look similar. The key to making sure public are trusting them is to how do we operationalize all these high-level principles? You know, those high-level principles do, do no evil, you know, 
um, have human-centered values? How do we operationalize it first uh, to, to a particular piece of software that needs a lot of work? Then how do we explain those to different stakeholders? So your stakeholders are not just the um, uh, general public. You have decision makers, you have developers, you have people who deeply understand the technology, but you also have people who are not very understanding about the technology. So you need to provide trustworthy evidence with different stakeholders uh, in mind when you present those uh, those evidence to them. And there's a difference between trust and trustworthiness. Some, some system can be very trustworthy. I mean, blockchain technology has been, uh, been said to be a very trustworthy technology by design, but people may not trust a very trust technology, trustworthy technology, because they, they don't see that, evidence, they don't understand it. So you need to turn those kind of trustworthy evidence to something that the public can understand. Greg, have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, look, I agree with Li Ming. I mean, that's why at the OECD, we decided that really we did need a set of high-level principles for responsible blockchain development. And that's, uh, you know, the document I mentioned is online at OECD that actually out those five principles I mentioned, they're actually about building trust, what you need to do. It is about, you know, getting people comfortable, interoperability, security, education, et cetera. But the other thing about it, I think, is you need trusted parties to uh, to take on things like the Australian ASX's initiative in using blockchain for clearing and settlement or the World Bank doing a digital bond issue where they go, well, actually, we're comfortable to use it. So it, I think it takes time. And I think you do need, if you want trusted parties to, uh, to have projects that are implemented that actually people go, well, actually, it's not that bad. Or, it, you know, if it's a regulated sector, if the regulators say, fine, we're comfortable that this can be used, um, whether it be a crypto exchange or whatever, uh, that's the sort of thing that uh, I think builds uh, confidence, uh, you know, I, in terms of uh, moving forward. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was thinking about it, um, in, you know, talking about, I think, Li Ming, you were talking about being able to use um, blockchain for uh, compliance. Um, and, you know, I, I guess you sort of look at that and you think, well, sitting beneath all this and sitting within smart contracts is is the code. And, uh, you know, that in a sense is making sure that the code is the right code is critical to trustworthiness. And so I guess there's a question in my mind about to what extent do we expect users to be able to, to do that? And are we just going to end up with another set of intermediaries to sort of be the ones that translate the understanding of blockchain through trustworthiness? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's the nature of the intermediaries. A, a lot of the intermediaries we were talking about are probably potentially disintermediary. It, it's around uh, like all this market-based uh, and to build, to, to connect uh, market uh, participants. But the, the responsible technology or responsible blockchain ones including the code, is about, like Greg said, introducing third parties who, I mean, you only have to examine the code once, and we don't expect uh, ordinary users to understand those code. If those code can be examined in some way by a trusted third party once, I mean, obviously that's, you know, if the code changes, or we need to do continuous monitoring. Uh, but that itself can introduce some level of trust. So I'm going to turn now to questions and also just remind the audience, um, obviously people have been diving in and putting some questions in and voting for questions from others, but now's your chance to get your questions in. We've got about um, 20 or so minutes left in our conversation, so if you've got something, a burning question, please make sure you, you, you jump onto Pigeonhole uh, now. Um, uh, top of the pops, a question from Leo, uh, which says, uh, how do you think Australia's regulatory approach to encryption and the removal of many data privacy laws might impact the ability to encourage innovation in blockchain in Australia? That's probably a question for Greg or Li Ming, I think. Uh, well, uh, I think at the end of the day, privacy is a, is a, a very important issue. And as I said, it's one of the points of principle in responsible blockchain usage. So, you've got to be careful about dismantling privacy because that then potentially affects uh, trust in the system. So I do think it's a, a balance uh, from my point of view. Uh, and it's in, often privacy regulation reflects the values of a country. And uh, so I, you know, that's where I'd come out on that. 
Li Ming, sorry, over to you. Uh, yeah, I, I think blockchain, because it's get this, people often talk about it as an immutable ledger, it uh, helps with confidence. So in, in some cases, sometimes whether it's regulation or law requires something. And what people worry about is who did what for, for you know, at when. And as long as that um, you know, chain of evidence is, is, is there and the right parties, uh, the law enforcement is examining that, I think that will actually increase a lot of the trust in that. You know, we can debate about whether that's the, you know, whether some law is the right law at this moment of time for what purpose. But if there's the underlying evidence is there to make sure it's not being, whatever the law is not being abused because of this um, uh, underlying uh, prominence, uh, that will help. I think, um, and please correct me if I'm wrong in saying this, but I think, you know, one of the um, examples that people have spoken a lot about in terms of the opportunity space is actually um, data um, and data protection and, and almost a counter perhaps to the question is that, you know, at the moment, uh, you know, one of the challenges with intermediaries is the benefits of, of scale um, and the um, scale, you know, that you build your reputation and you, you're trusted just by sheer volume. And one of the things that people have been worried about is actually data monopolies. Um, and so blockchain, you know, presents itself as an, as an alternative to that. And, you know, we talked about equity. I took the equity um, and diversity conversation in one particular way, but I think one of the points that you started with, Greg, and each of you sort of echoed was that blockchain does enable smaller participants to come into the system and have a trustworthy process. Um, that's that's because of its disintermediation. Disintermediation is is more trustworthy, and so I think that's perhaps a bit of a counter too. That you know it does provide for. Um, uh, a challenge to some of the data um, developments that we've seen in, in countries like Australia. Is that is that a fair conclusion? Nodding. <laughs> I, can see, yeah. I can see the nodding. The rest of you can't, so I'm just going to say yes. I'm I'm spot on. Um, I can tell you too that one of the challenges being a moderator on this topic is that you've got to understand all of the acronyms straight out of the gate. So let me go to another question here, which is. What are the biggest barriers to the introduction of CBDCs, which is central bank digital currencies for, for those of you who may not immediately un understand that acronym, uh, in Australia? And do you think that this has potential to open up a connection between what is happening in DeFi and traditional finance? Who would like to unpack that question? Wait, that's got to be for you too, Greg, doesn't it? Yeah, very happy to do that. I, I actually sat on the FSB's... Uh stablecoin working group when they like trying, when Facebook was trying to introduce Libra. So look, as I said, basically uh, it's the missing link at the moment is a is a um, perhaps a, 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 a wholesale central bank current, digital currency. Retail is probably in a country like Australia is probably less of an issue because we have a very fast payment system. Uh, but at the wholesale level, it really is the missing link. And also for cross-border payments, obviously, uh, it, it's potentially uh, you know, faster and quicker and et cetera. So uh, it's inevitable. Uh, and it's just a matter of, I think, uh, time that it will happen uh, because it is the missing piece of actually enabling a fully digitalized uh, financial system. So, and, you know, most central banks have been looking at this uh, for probably five to seven years. So, uh, and some it's more, um, you know, higher up uh, than others, but we are going to see it because, again, it's just part of the development. Uh, but again, you know, one of the issues that comes out is what does it mean in terms of, cent of, of runs, uh, you know, on the, you know, you means you can switch out very quickly, but again, you can deal with that through uh, algorithms that may just slow down the, uh, the uh, a run on a bank. What does it mean in terms of the effect on the actual banking system if you have it in the retail space uh, for access to deposits? But they're all the sort of issues uh, that are being worked through at the moment, actually. And in some countries, clearly, the inclusivity angle is very important where people, you have a high unbanked population. We don't have that in Australia. So that's why the retail angle is probably less compelling. But as I say, uh, I believe that uh, there is a either stable coin. What will happen? The central banks won't have much option because if suddenly you have a stable coin coming into the market, it will put pressure on the central bank to think about doing something uh, with a CBDC. 
Li Ming or any or, or Doug, anything yeah. to add to that? I mean, not not of the scale that Greg's discussed there, but in terms of yeah, the blockchain pilot here, we're obviously going to be uh, uh, experimenting with a stable coin, but on a private permissioned uh, blockchain. So it's just between the the participating industry uh, players and, and and obviously the ATO in this case. So so you can trial in, in a more safe private permissioned uh, um, uh, you know uh, blockchain environment or protocol. So um, yeah, that's at more micro level. So hopefully we'll provide provide some Australian learnings uh, for implementing stable coin through this project. Yeah, I would say there are a lot of uh, interesting questions to be answered. I, I don't pretend to know them all because I think RBA is currently part of the digital finance CRC and uh, their primary interest in engaging with the CRC is in the central uh, bank digital currency and, and bringing all the people in the CRC from finance regulation and digital to answer some of the questions on their mind. Doug, I think I've got a question for you. You touched on some of the examples that uh, you're involved with, um, you know, some that were of great interest to me, moisturiser, a bit of gin, a bit of whiskey. Um, but there's a broader question around um, the uh, developments in agriculture, uh, sort of blockchain implications for developments in agriculture. So I think people are interested to hear a little bit more about that if you've got more to add. Uh, sure, sure. Well, I think yeah, it comes down it comes down to typically the ability to to prove provenance of of where you're sourcing goods from. So the ability to 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 empower the the raw producers uh, to provide lineage of of their product and quality assurance of of the production of that product through the supply chain, so they can command a high premium at at um, you know markets and points of sale and so on and 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 through um, the you know smart labelling of of products uh, at the point of consumption consumers are therefore more informed i mean obviously they need uh, education to scan certain qr codes on products and and uh, and you know start seeing the volumes of this this capability in store and so on but um, that ability for lineage from the point of consumption or purchase point all the way back to to raw production you know what materials we use what processes of farming were used and who what organization was it and and they can promote you know their their responsible farming processes their their the use of pesticides that are compliant or, or you know, I'm out of my depth there, but uh, I'm not a farmer. Uh, but yes, absolutely. It's, it's about um, the transparency and lineage uh, and, and hopefully putting a little bit more power back in the, in the, in their raw producers' hands um, so that they can differentiate and amplify their brand further up the value chain that, that uh, through traditional means might be uh, more in the hands of, of the intermediaries and, and, and wholesalers, retailers. Are there any um, particular products that you think lend themselves or were you seeing uh, – you know, more interest rather than others in terms of, you know, export opportunities or things like that? Oh, I, know. I think pretty much any product is 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 rife uh, for this. Um, I don't know, yeah, Greg, with your international experience, uh -huh. I mean, I, I've seen it across, you know, uh -huh. fish, uh, yes, <laughs> uh, fish, oil. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, look, uh, if you were well, actually on OECD's website, we have a whole area of responsible business conduct that actually has looked at blockchain applications and, the one I gave is, uh, I think, really interesting. The uh, in the Democratic Republic of Com Congo on uh, uh, exporting, where there's a problem of artisanal mining and trying to make sure that the sourcing of that um, product for batteries is actually done in a responsible way. Uh, or, you know, in the clothing sector, that you're not employing slave labour um, for the you know, manufacture of clothing. For example, Hugo Boss is uh, has a blockchain project. Uh, you know, that actually has responsible sourcing. So, yeah, and the area of providence is is growing quite rapidly. Consumers do want to know, like for Australia, we want to, you know, buyers want to know that, you know, what comes from Australia is actually coming, you know, it's fresh and it's it's coming from the sources that are responsible. So, uh, yeah, the providence area is a, a big growth area uh, for many, uh, many countries. And Greg, does this mean that we won't get into those disputes around calling champagne champagne? <laughs> I think that, that uh, that's a good question, but I don't think it would, <laughs> I'm not going to go anywhere near that topic. It's it's not going to. Who cares what the name is? It's just going to be what the what the token is. <laughs> but but I, what, what is interesting is you know the changing social license. People are now concerned as to where what they're buying comes from. Whether it's it's you know whether it's going to be with you know how it was produced in terms of carbon usage or whether it's you know say slave labour, whatever. People are concerned about it now more and more. Um, so this is where I think blockchain will play a very important role uh, in the future, frankly, and also in terms of financing those type of things. 
Um, I've got a question which I think you've sort of answered for you, Greg, which is that someone's noticed your SDG pin um, and uh-huh. was sort of asking about, you know, what role blockchain plays um, in um, helping to meet these goals. But I think I think you've sort of unpacked that in your last answer in terms of, you know, you, you could align almost, you know, the, the prerequisites, if you like, for achieving those fact, goals. Uh, they actually enable the uh, monitoring of people's compliance with a lot of the SDGs, actually. Uh-huh. Um, there was another question from Michael directed to you, Greg, but I'm going to actually open it up to to each of the um, each of you because it it goes to a comparison around um, you know how Greg you would rate Australia's uptake of blockchain opportunities compared to say our European peers. But I think each of you might have a perspective from the work that you do or, or people you're involved with just to understand you know where you think Australia sits um, in the world and. If I could add a follow-up question, you know, I think each of you in some ways has referenced the sort of existing economic infrastructure as being an enabler, but yet we're talking about this being almost a challenge to the existing economic sort of infrastructure and regulatory infrastructure. So so how, how do you see our starting point and, and how we can leverage those comparative advantages? So where are we now and, and how do we um, extend our position or leapfrog some others? Um, I'll start with you, Greg, and then... Lee Ming and then Doug, if that's all right. Yeah, look, uh, I think, you know, we've got a, a lot of the fundamentals right in terms of the uh, the blockchain, you know, the, C, the CRC that's been announced and uh, the pilot projects. Uh, but it's a competition, you know. We've got competitors like Singapore, for example, or the UK. Uh, this, is not, this is not stopping. Uh, it's continuing. So, uh, for example, what I said, you know, what you've got to do is create that image that we are at the front of the pack, you know, rather than just, uh, you know, along there. So, for example, what I said about creating a, a cryptocurrency exchanges, enabling that. So this, this is where a lot of leading jurisdictions are. They're actually enabling cryptocurrency exchanges, crypto custody, um, thinking about smart contracts and legally enforceable enforceability, looking at DeFi and actually putting in legislation that actually actually allows DeFi to occur, um, which is where you know Singapore is currently with they're at the leading edge. So, you know, again, it's like a business. You've actually got to say, well, it's got to have a wow factor. Australia can actually do this, and it's a great place to do it. And we've got, I think, the component parts. But now it's going to be about executing, and we've got to keep our eye behind us because, uh, uh, you know, it's like basically we've got to stay ahead. So that's what I would say. There's some some there's some there's good near-term wins uh, to, to get the momentum really going. Lee Ming? Uh, yeah, so I'm probably coming from a science and technology point of view. Australian's blockchain research uh, is really top in the world. And coming from Monash, MIT, Sydney University, including Beijing Chuan, in, in multiple various rankings, uh, Australian's blockchain science, in terms of uh, its impact and influence uh, in national international standing, is really very high, top 10 in various rankings. But the challenge is to turn some of this uh, science into commercialization opportunities, which is why we need to work with um, the industry to, to make those things happen. And because the nature of blockchain regarding a lot of its cross-border uh, data flow and international uh, consultants around blockchain, I, I think there is a lot of, not just competition, but collaboration with our close allies in that space. So in recent past, we worked with Indian, with UK, on a lot of the cross-border projects uh, regarding blockchain. I think there's an opportunity in that space. Doug, how are you saying things? Well, I'm I'm testament to to the growth. Uh, I've come from a different industry into blockchain of recent times, and and I'm loving it. I I see the huge potential uh, here, and, and I know a lot of uh, Australians working in professional services and technology also see the excitement uh, factor around around the use cases, and and I think you, the use cases have been expedited by COVID right now. So so I think you know uh, the three actors are very much aware um, of the need for uh, a transformation in um, using. Um, they may not know they need to use blockchain, but they'll be accepting of the benefits provided by blockchain. Um, I think uh, Australia's always been a pioneer and and punched above its weight uh, in regard to uh, industry and and government success so i think uh the you know, with the international borders hopefully opening again uh you know before christmas uh i think there is a there's a problem still to be solved as to 
how do we uh, uh, how do we um, validate uh, the vaccine efficacy for uh, different countries uh, that, that will start coming to Australia? There will be safe travel zones where we obviously have um, you know a, a, a trust between the organisations. Although in the last week, trust is dissipated between a few. Uh, <laughs> however, you know uh, as the borders open and more more people travel, again, um, you know we're going to be faced with how do we validate the vaccine credentials issued by governments that we may not be so close to. So I think there are you know, huge opportunities for Australia to take the lead with some of those international use cases. So uh, I'm hoping uh, Australia does what it does well, which is outperform typically the ponds in cricket, which I'm not so happy about, but uh, in, in industry and, and tech. Um, you've given me a nice little plug, Doug, for um, one of our live streams coming up next week. Uh, I, I had an, a preliminary conversation with the head of Australia's Border Force and, and one of the very issues we were talking about is just the realities of reopening airports um, mm -hmm. and it, to international travel. And we spoke directly to this challenge of mm -hmm. how are we going to verify um, vaccine mm -hmm. um, passports or whatever you want to call them. And so um, that's a good plug there. And uh, I'll, use <laughs> that, I'll use that question. Um, we've got just a few more minutes and I'm, I'm going to make sure that my end comments are super short so I can get this last question in. Um, and I'm sort of, I'm going to truncate a little bit because the, the, the question was really around where will you see things in 2030 or 2040? I'm going to say 2030 because I know this is a fast-moving space, but to each of you, just where would you like to see um, blockchain in Australia in 2030 and what's the most important or, you know, the top two things that need to happen to, to get us there? Um, maybe I'll start with you, Lee Ming, and then Doug and give Greg the final word. Uh, yeah, I, I think as I mentioned, blockchain is really a uh, general purpose technology helping a lot of industries. And one of the key things we see through the digital finance CRC is tokenization of assets. Once you call tokenization, the tokenizing the assets, there are so many other opportunities you can do. A lot of the inclusiveness will be introduced. Um, so, and, and that tokenization actually can come from all industries in Australia, not, uh, especially the very competitive industries. So I, I would say that's the thing we will see in 2030. Thanks, Lee Ming. Doug? Yeah, and I, I think it's uh, it's going to be um, a, a transition of, of the tech workforce to really adopt and scale this this capability. I think um, people will, will see as the use cases get adopted further, people will see the opportunity to broaden their career uh, potential. You know, blockchain is only going to grow exponentially over uh, until 2030. So for people working in technology who want to, you know, sort of protect their careers and 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 uh, you know maybe accelerate their careers. I think you'll find a lot of uh, motivated technologists in in uh, in slightly adjacent sectors uh, adopting this at, at speed and scale. Thanks, Doug. Greg, I think by 2030, what it should the view should be that actually it's like uh, back when they invented electricity. It's actually how you get things done. You use blockchain, so it essentially you have a normalization where we're not really talking about why does it work we're confident we know why it works and that's people are actually using it and i think that's that's where we'll be in 2030 i, I think maybe later um uh, i think in terms of two key things i think one uh, i think as i said before the payment leg is the asset tokenization is important but it, without having a, a payment leg for this uh, that is in, allows essentially at atomic settlement. Um, it's a, miss a very important missing link. Whether that comes from a central bank digital currency or a stable coin, it's the missing link, right? If you want to be completely digital um, and take advantage. The second one is, I think, enabling uh, decentralized finance uh, legally uh, is, I think, going to be important uh, in terms of really disrupting the uh, the financial system and really gaining the benefits from efficiency, reducing friction costs. That basically means removing a lot of other intermediaries, Melinda. Well, um, thank you so much. I knew our hour was just going to run away from us. Um, I do think that was a really nice way to close out, though, because I think what it reminds us is just the tremendous opportunity that is provided by disintermediation. We've seen that through the internet. There's a lot of positive impacts. There's some other things we're going to have to think our way through. But I guess to the audience, um, what I've learned today is that this is a technology that we're going to be using like the internet. And so the more each of us gets comfortable with it and builds our own understanding and figures out all of the potential in it, then the, the greater the opportunities uh, will be. 
both uh, in terms of public benefit, but also in terms of um, economic opportunities and, and business business growth. Um, thank thank you to each of our uh, panelists today, Doug Campbell, Liming Ju, and Greg Medcraft. What a what a fantastic sort of hour of information and insight. Um, the, of course, our live stream will be available uh, on uh, on the CETA website in due course. Um, we've got more interesting things coming up as well, as is always the case. I've already flagged the Australian Border Force, uh, but later this week we also have the Honourable Julia Gillard um, coming to talk to us about um, mental health. So if you're interested in any of those events, please get on the website, ceda.com.au. Um, thank you again uh, to each of our panellists and for the audience, if you've got any uh, views or thoughts on today's events, you can provide us some feedback and rate the event uh, through the Pigeonhole app as well. Um, thanks very much and have a wonderful afternoon.